How you doing, everybody? This is video number two, where we're going to take a look at our diagram of cellular respiration. Last video, we looked at anaerobic respiration, which is what happens when oxygen is not present. This video, we're going to focus on aerobic respiration, which is what happens when oxygen is present. I think you'll see it's way better to use oxygen than not. So let's get back to our diagram. It's going to be great. There we go. And here it is. Here it is in all its glory. And just to recap, you know, here's glycolysis, which was an anaerobic process. And then, of course, some type of fermentation would follow that when there's not oxygen present. All that happens out in the cytoplasm of the cell. With aerobic respiration, you still start with glycolysis. You break down glucose into two 3-carbon pyruvates, you make your 2 ATP, and you generate two NADHs. So if oxygen is present, the party moves down here into the mitochondrion. Okay, so this is my mitochondrion right here. It has an outer membrane, which I drew as a single line. It has an inner membrane, which I drew as a double squiggle line to give it some thickness. Um, the folds of the inner membrane are called cristae, and it's highly folded to increase the surface area, so there's more molecular machinery to do respiration. And I think, yeah, I think we're good right there. So here's what happens. This black arrow coming down is the two pyruvate molecules. If there's oxygen present, they enter the mitochondrion into this center area eventually, which is called the matrix. As the two pyruvates come in, they're oxidized. Two carbon dioxides are given off and two more NADHs get made. Well, the CO2, we breathe out. The NADHs, remember, are high energy electron carriers and they're gonna make us ATPs in the end. And once those pyruvates are oxidized, they turn into acetyl coenzyme A molecules, which we abbreviate acetyl CoA. These acetyl-CoA molecules go through a cycle of chemical reactions called the Krebs cycle. It's Dr. Krebs figured this out. And just like with the Calvin cycle in photosynthesis, you wind up with the same thing you start with. That's why it's a cycle of reactions, which we don't care about the details of, but here's what we do care about. It happens in the matrix of the mitochondrion. When those two acetyl-CoAs go through the cycle, because remember there were two pyruvates, so there's two acetyl-CoAs, Two ATPs are made. That's great. That's what we're trying to make. Six NADHs, okay. Two FADH2 molecules. Now these are different, but they do the same thing as NADHs. They carry high energy electrons through an electron transport chain and make us ATPs in the end. And four more CO2s are given off. Just a quick note about the CO2s. Number one, I always wondered if we're not breathing in much carbon dioxide, about 1% of the atmosphere is CO2, I thought to myself when I was younger, how do we always have CO2 to breathe out? Like, where does it come from? Well, it turns out every cell in your body is doing cellular respiration 24-7. And so breaking down glucose produces carbon dioxide. So there's always some to be gotten rid of. Also notice each CO2 has one carbon two here, four here, that's six carbons. Glucose, what we started with, had six carbons. So we've completely basically chopped up glucose at this point, um, and we've made our energy, uh, high energy electron carriers from it. So after the Krebs cycle, the final step in the process is the electron transport chain. This is just like in photosynthesis, photosystem two and one. A series of molecules in the folds of the inner membrane in the cristae, they play hot potato with the high energy electrons. So all your NADHs, all your FADH2s, this green arrow coming down is the NADHs that we made in glycolysis. They come in too. They all dump their electrons into this electron transport chain. The electrons go down the chain like a hot potato, giving off energy. That energy is used to pump H pluses from the matrix out here into the inner membrane space. This is active transport, low to high concentration, 
uses energy from our hot potato electron. Just like before, we let these H pluses diffuse back into the matrix from where they started. Sounds dumb again, but we know from photosynthesis there's a trick. We make them diffuse through facilitated diffusion through ATP synthase carrier molecules. Every time an H plus diffuses through ATP synthase, an ATP gets made. And that's our goal. In fact, a lot of ATP gets made this way. This is known as chemiosmosis, which is what happened in photosystem two. That's how we made ATP there. So it's the same process, which I think is a little wink to the fact that these two processes, aerobic respiration and photosynthesis, sort of evolved in tandem. Now the last detail I haven't mentioned is what's in red right here. And it's very important to, to note I said all of this only happens if oxygen is present. Well, we haven't mentioned oxygen once until now. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. Oxygen sits at the bottom of the electron transport chain, catches the electrons, a couple of H pluses hop on, and you make water. Without oxygen doing this, the electron transport chain would back up. Everything would back up through the Krebs cycle all the way back up to those pyruvates. And if there was no oxygen, we would do lactic acid fermentation, if it's a human. But when oxygen is present, catching those electrons, it keeps everything flowing. So that's it. That's the process. Let's look at how many ATPs we make. Glycolysis makes two. So without oxygen, one, glucate, one glucose makes you two ATPs. With oxygen, let's look at that total. Well, we made a total of NADH, total of 10 NADHs. Each one of those that dumps electrons into the electron transport chain winds up making three ATPs. So we made 10 of them, that's 30 ATPs. Every FADH2 that dumps its electrons into the electron transport chain makes two ATPs. Well, we made two of them, so that's four. And we made four ATPs, like I said, two from glycolysis and two from the Krebs cycle, that's another four. So 38 ATPs. The real number, though, is 36. And here's why. These NADHs that we made in glycolysis, see this green arrow coming down? It costs a 1 ATP each toll to get them into the mitochondria. So each NADH that comes in uh, costs you an ATP. But that's fine, because once they're in, they're going to make you three. So you're still making out on the deal. But since there was two of them that had to come in, your 38 goes down to 36. And in reality, it's even a little less than that because every once in a while, some of these H pluses sneak back into the matrix without going through ATP synthase. The inner membrane is a little bit leaky. And so they don't generate the ATPs that they could have. So like I said, the real number is about 34 point something, I think, per glucose. But let's, let's take 36. Without oxygen, just glycolysis and fermentation, you make two ATPs per glucose. With oxygen, you make 36 ATPs from the same one glucose starting molecule. So aerobic respiration is way better. Complex life forms, you could argue, couldn't exist unless aerobic respiration evolved as a process. Multicellular organisms that are active hunters, like a lot of animals are, need more than two ATPs per glucose. So this is 1,800% better to do aerobic respiration as opposed to anaerobic. All right. So that is video two. Um, we're going to go through this again several times, like we did with the photosynthesis diagram, or I guess we already will have because I'm probably going to assign this one as more of a follow-up to, to us going through it live together. But that's it. So every cell does some form of cellular respiration because all cells need to get energy out of food and store it as ATP. So let me know if you have any questions, book some time, email me, let me know, and I will see you on the screen.